This is Camillus Robinson with uh, my co-host John Tui. We're here together on Kings, Killers, and Clowns with our guest, Tom Kaminsky. He had a long career as a supervisor and investigator for the New York City Department of Investigation. We're discussing his book today, The East Coast Mafia, uh, the, the East Village Mafia, I apologize. Uh, the East Village is an area that's long been known for it, uh, as an artistic epicenter. Uh, originally, we had the, the Beat era. A lot of the, the Beat poets came through, Gregory Corso, uh, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg. Uh, there was the folk movement. It was an avant-garde artistic area. It, it's long been an epicenter of, of arts throughout the New York area. And what I think a lot of people don't know and what Tom's going to educate us on today is that it is also, uh, there's also a, a, been a thriving underworld and it's been a strong place of uh, mafia activity. So Tom, would you like to, to explain to us what exactly is the crux of your book and what are we talking about? Tom, why don't you show us your book? Would you do that? Let's, let's see. Certainly. Yeah. How's that? Oh, you got it? Back it up a little bit. There you go. There we go. Village, the East Village, East Mafia. Village Mafia. The East Village Mafia, Thomas Kaminsky, and we're going to put a link on this so you can buy the book directly and we'll put Absolutely. links on Facebook pages as well for you, okay? So let's, let's, let's hear about the, the East Village. I think a lot of people do know about it as, a, as an artistic place, but what is, what is the story with the, the mob in the East Village? Well, uh, beginning in Prohibition, early 1920s, uh, they had, there was a, a big mob presence, a presence, and it lasted up until 1990. You had three mafia families. You had the Gambinos, you had the Genovese, each had a crew in the East Village, and you had Joseph Bonanno's favorite social club, which he would visit twice a week for over 30 years. Uh, I grew up on 14th Street and MUA, just to give you an idea. The East Village is probably about 100 square blocks. Everything in the city is square blo is blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So the East Village is about 100 square blocks. The Italian neighborhood or the enclave was probably 10 square blocks. And oh. Oh. Did we lose you? We did. Let me uh, let me pause here. Tom, we need to. All right, we're back. We had a little technical difficulty. So, uh, Tom, uh, back to you. East Village is a Manhattan neighborhood consisting primarily of tenements. Uh, on the on the ground level are the stores, the storefronts, the mom and pop shops. Uh, I'm sure you've both seen. Uh, Godfather 2, the mm -hmm. scenes on the street with, uh, with uh, young Don Vito Corleone. Right. That was the East Village and is the East Village. That was literally filmed on East 6th Street in the East Village. Mm -hmm. So those tenements and those storefronts are still there. And uh, for many years, it was an immigrant neighborhood starting with the Germans in the mid 1800s, the Italians, you had Poles, you had Jews, you had Russians. The Italians settled in the very northern part of the East Village, which ran on the east side from Third Avenue to uh, uh, Avenue A, which is about three blocks, and from 14th Street on the northern part to 10th Street. So you're talking about an area of only about 12 square blocks and may have been the smallest Italian enclave in New York City. But as I said, it had uh, two crews, Genovese crew, Gambino crew. It had uh, Joe Bonanno's social club. It, had, it was the source of, uh, of much of the French connection heroin that came into America after World War II. It was, it was shipped into the East Village and distributed. The Gambino crew in the East Village, literally in, in, in bars and restaurants and social clubs that I identify in the book, uh, distributed, received and distributed all that French connection heroin. Wow. And I think these social clubs, a lot of people don't, don't, don't know, or, or, or maybe some do, but it was, it was literally just a building where 
only mafia guys would go. It said members only, and they had they had names on the outside that had nothing to do with what went on. But but mob guys would go in. They would have espresso. They would sit around and basically not worry about law enforcement or any or, or the public. And they would they would discuss whatever. And then law enforcement sort of moved in, but. It was just a place where, where mob guys could go and, and discuss business, basically. Is that right? That's right. I have in the book, I have a chapter on what is called the Shoreview Social Club. That is That was uh, Joseph Bonanno, one of the five uh, family original uh, Dons. That was his favorite social club. Like I said, he would go there twice a week for decades. And what was interesting about that social club is that it was like the United Nations of mob social clubs. Mm -hmm. It was uh, also frequented by Genovese family mobsters and Gambino family mobsters from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, funny story, they had a stolen fire hydrant out in front on the curb so that no, no <laughs> one would park there, only, only for banana royalty. Uh -huh. uh, the buzzer on the door, you know, there was a buzzer that led into the apartments above the social club on the ground floor. There was a, a sticker that said, J.E. Hoover. <laughs> and uh, I had, most of my chapter that I write about is about an actual social club meeting uh, that was uh, reported. Uh, it involved the control of a Holiday Inn in New Jersey. And it was actually, there was a sit down. I have a blow by blow description of how it went. Uh, it's very interesting. Wow. Wait, is the building still there? The building is still there. There's a fancy restaurant on the ground floor now. Uh, uh. Now the other uh, famous, uh, most famous person I think from the East Village, or probably the most famous, is uh, Lucky Luciano. Yeah. Lucky Luciano, lived on East 10th Street between Avenue A and First Avenue from uh, 1907 to 1927. That's where he started his gang. Uh, that's where he got busted selling heroin. Lucky Luciano was a huge heroin dealer. Yeah. And, and he started out, like I said, with a gang. Yeah. I think it's pretty famous about how he met Meyer Lansky when, when they were young kids. Yeah. And one of the places I talk about frequently in the book, because for decades it was a gathering place for the mob, was a place called D. Roberti's Pastry Shop. And that was right on First Avenue, right around the corner from Lucky's Tenement. Now, uh, what happened is Lucky, as I said, uh, he was first heroin bust. He was 19 years old in 1916, got busted in the neighborhood selling heroin and opium. In 1923, he gets busted again, selling heroin and opium. In 1923, mm -hmm. Lucky Luciano is working for Joe the Boss Mazzaria as, as his bodyguard and uh, his chauffeur. He's also working for Arnold Rothstein, and he's selling heroin himself. Now, this just shows you how much he loved it because the profits were just enormous. But Rothstein was the source, you know, um, he was a big drug dealer too, but he's managed to avoid that reputation somehow for the decade. That's right. I think everybody, you know, a lot of these, these mobsters who are murderers and drug dealers, over the years there just becomes an image, you know, of, I wouldn't call it chivalry, but, uh, yeah. it, you know, they, they get this gloss to them. Yeah. 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 It, it shows well, early the, on. Lu Luciano's diversification. You know, he's sticking, like you said, in the Italian in the Italian enclaves, but he's also moving out and and it, it, that young working for working for a, a Jewish contingent. Interesting. Exactly, and he was hooking up with Meyer Lansky. He was hooking up with Louis Bookalter. Uh, that's where one of Lucian where Luciano had vision. He the older Italian uh, gangsters, you know, they called them Mustache Pete's, would kept it Italian. They would not deal with the Jewish gangsters. Some of them wouldn't, the Sicilians wouldn't deal with the, uh, the mainland Italian gangsters. It was that cliquish. Uh, in fact, that's an interesting story. Uh, they were, there were wars and prohibition between Italian gangs. And uh, the, first, the first boss I write about is Joseph Mazzaria. He lived on, on 2nd Avenue and East 5th Street in the heart of the uh, village. Uh, he... He uh, was powerful because he controlled an area on Mulberry Street, south 
of the East Village, which is now known as Little Italy. Uh, it was called the Curb Exchange. And in Prohibition, that's where all the liquor dealing went on, liquor or alcohol. Uh, literally, it was on the street and people would come and buy their booze or their alcohol at the Curb Exchange. So Joe Mazzaria's gang controlled that. But there was a stronger boss at the time named Salvatore Tequila. Salvatore Tequila, his gang would later go on to become the Gambino family. Whereas Mazzaria's gang, interestingly, would later go on and become the Genovese family. So you had this, this starting out in prohibition before the five families. So Tequila sends uh, a hitman to kill Mazzaria. And his name was Umberto Valenti. He was from East 14th Street. Umberto Valenti uh, charges up as, as uh, Mazzaria is walking out of his tenement. He charges up to him, shoots a few rounds. Mazzaria is ducking and diving, misses him completely, gets him through the straw hat, two shots. Mazzaria survives. They arrange a truce for three days later. There's going to be a meeting between Valenti's gang and Mazzaria's gang at John's restaurant, East 12th Street. John's is still there. Now, whether it's going to survive the pandemic or not, I don't know. But Lucky Luciano and Joe Mazzaria used to eat dinner in the back. It mm. opened in 1908. And as, as I said, it was still there up until the time of the pandemic. You mean the, uh, actual, you mean the actual restaurant? Oh, yes. Still serving. You walk in there, the owners will show you the table. Where, where Joe Mazzaria and, and Lucky Luciano used to eat. I'm friends with the owners. What street is it on? I'd like to go, actually, before. Sure. John's. John's Restaurant 12. Oh, I'll take you there. John's, uh, it's off 2nd Avenue on East 12th Street. Wow. Yeah. I'd yeah. love Mazzaria's place is gone or his house. No, the house is still there. You know, really? that's a, yeah, that's, that building is still there. But here's what happens. This is, this is what's interesting about that event, the meeting, the so-called truce. Uh, during Prohibition, much like Chicago, there were wild shootouts between these gangs, mostly Italian on Italian. In the streets, during the daytime, civilian casualties all over the place. It was, it was crazy. So here they get to in front of John's restaurant. Uh, before they even get inside, they start shooting each other. Yeah. Uh, a, a street sweeper is shot. A young girl is shot. And the New York Times describes what happened. Uh, a witness tells them he's watching the shootout and uh, everybody's ducking and dodging. He says, this guy stands up. What happened is uh, Umberto Valenti ran out onto Second Avenue, which is a main thoroughfare in Manhattan, and jumps on the runner of a taxi cab to escape the shootout. He says, this guy stands up, points his revolver, calmly squeezes off shot after shot after shot, hits Umbert, Umberto Valenti, winds up, his, he's shot in the heart, and he dies within an hour. Right. The shooter, by mob lore, Lucky Luciano. Huh. And that starts Lucky Luciano's career with, with Joe the Boss Mazzaria. He becomes his chauffeur, his bodyguard, his right-hand man. Yeah, yeah. Now and the first, okay. I, I, there are five bosses killed by the people in the East Village Mafia, either directly or complicitly. Salvatore Tequila, the one I told you that was, uh, that was the boss of the biggest gang, in 1928, six years later, he goes to the East Village. He takes his wife and his daughter to a doctor's appointment at 13th Street and Avenue A. The, the building on the cover of my book is the building uh. at 13th Street and Avenue A. It's still there. And on the, there was a doctor's office there. So he drops them off and he stands by his car on the street. Three men approach him. Now this is, this is Lucky Luciano's territory. Three men approach him. They said there was an argument he shot nine times and killed. And the, the day after that shooting, Joseph Mazzaria became Joe the Boss Mazzaria. In, in front of his wife and his, and his daughter. He's, he's they, were in the, they were inside, but inside. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they never ID'd who did it, but it's clear, it was clearly Luciano's gang. That's their turf. If, if you're on, uh, in China, uh, in Little Italy, what's left of it, right? 
so what you're saying is it's for lack of another up going uh, up towards Harlem from Little Italy, right? Well, actually, it's it's not that far. Uh, it's 14th Street. Harlem, to use a number, is like 125th Street. Yeah, right? way way up. So down. we're talking 14th Street. Yeah, way that's way downtown, right? Yeah, downtown. In fact, you've I know you sure surely have heard of the Lower East Side. Yeah, where all the immigrants came in over the years and in, into Manhattan. Yeah, the East Village was always considered was part of the Lower East Side until the mid 1960s. It was renamed the East Village for real estate purposes. So it was always <laughs> the Lower East Side. Yeah, I, I'm sure you hear how, you know how these neighborhoods all of a sudden are renamed, right? You know so, what? So I'm going to take that offer. I'll come up and we can walk around if you have time. Absolutely, I'll give you a tour. Man, I would love it. Yeah, yeah. And a few more good stories from the neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you're familiar with the movie Goodfellas. Yeah. Okay. Remember uh, 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 the scene where uh, DeVito uh, really is, what's no, that? I, I, uh, DeVito Joe or? Pesci, okay, Joe yeah. Pesci plays Tommy DeVito. Yes. In fact, Joe Pesci won an Academy Award yes. for that role. And there's the famous bar scene where uh, he goes nuts and he kills Billy Bats. Right. Yes. Well, there really was a Gambino gangster named Billy Bats. Billy Bats Gambino. And Tommy DeVito is, was really Tommy DeSimone, who was an associate in the Lucchese family. So in the movie, uh, Tommy DeVito is taken to be made, and they kill him before he's ever made for killing a made man. Mm -hmm. As you know, an associate can't kill a made man. Right. So in real life, what happened is, yes, Tommy DeSimone killed... Billy Batts, who was Billy Benvena, that was his real name, and he was a friend of John Gotti. So the person who killed uh, Tommy DeSimone was a, a guy named Tommy Agro, who was a crew member of the East Village Gambino f uh, family. And uh, I have a picture of him standing outside of Deber Birdie's restaurant with his capo. His capo was... Uh, was uh, later to become the underboss of the Gambino crime family. The reason he, he became the underboss is because he assisted John Gotti in 1986 with killing Paul Castellano. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing train of events. Yeah. What I did in the book that I think is a little different than most mafia books, in most books they focus on one gangster or one gang right. or the, you know, the law enforcement. I pick a neighborhood and I profiled 15 different uh, uh, bosses, capos, soldiers who came from that neighborhood or hung out in that neighborhood, committed their crimes in that neighborhood. And I, I uh, pinpoint the bars, the restaurants, the social clubs, where they did that. And uh, uh, as I say, it's, it's an amazing story because you're looking at a neighborhood over time, over a 70 year period. And you start to see these connections. Uh, another interesting story is a guy named Joseph Biondo. Uh, very few people have heard of him. Joseph Biondo was in Lucky Luciano's teenage gang. He grew up on East 14th Street, about a block away from my, where I grew up later, uh, much later. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was in his teenage gang. As I, I told you, Lucky Luciano was busted very, very early for selling drugs. Well, in 1919, Joseph Biondo was busted for selling drugs. Right. Later on in 1946, in December 1946, I'm sure you're aware of the famous mob meeting in Cuba. Right. Well, in that meeting, Lucky Luciano set up the whole French connection drug trade. Yeah. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to get this through from Turkey, through Sicily, through France. Uh, we're going to send it into the ports we control, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and Tampa, Florida, and New York. And he said, in New York, the Gambino family is going to control it through Joseph Biondo. So he picks his buddy, his teenage drug dealing buddy. They used to live in an apartment on East 14th Street and mug Italian immigrants when they were kids 
for jewelry. I mean, these are street thieves and drug dealers. They went on to become multi-million dollar tonnage selling heroin. Yeah. And uh, uh, as you know, Lucky Luciano moved over to Italy uh, many times. Uh, Joseph Biondi would go over there and visit him. In fact, uh, are you familiar with the story of Italian pharmaceutical heroin? No. No. This is an interesting story because it brings in another gentleman who I write about. Uh, he's the cop from the neighborhood. His name is Charles Siragusa. And he grew up on 15, he was born on 15th Street and Avenue A, literally uh, a block away from Joseph Biondo and five blocks away from Lucky Luciano. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Siragusa, his uncle, excuse me, his, his grandfather was shotgunned to death in Sicily for not paying extortion to the mob there. And his uncle owned a drugstore in the East Village. And he used to hear stories about how the locals were dragged into the drugstore. They were burnt by the mafia. They were beaten up by the mafia for, you know, this was going back to the days of the Black Hand. Uh, in the East Village. Uh, so he hated the mafia. So Charles Siragusa joins the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, most underrated agency there is when it comes to the mafia and prosecuting the mafia. He starts as a typist. He, next thing you know, he's doing buy and busts on the street. Uh, he works his way up to the number two job, director, uh, uh, deputy director. But along the way, he becomes the uh, director of their first overseas bureau in Rome. And he knows about Lucky Luciano, yeah. uh, who's now exiled in Naples, and his connections, uh, his, his setting up of the French connection. So he makes uh, a bunch of, uh, of arrests, yeah. uh, along with Italian police in Italy. And it's Italian pharmaceutical heroin. What happened is the Italian government authorized big pharmaceutical companies owned by some of the biggest names in Italy. I'm talking about royalty, yeah. uh, very rich people, authorizes them to, to, to produce heroin and for pharmaceutical use. So a later audit showed that there was probably about 20 pounds that went to pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical use. Over a thousand pounds was diverted to the mafia through Luciano, through Biondo. In fact, they were, they, they were arrested once. They had to let him go because they had no proof. But they were actually arrested once in Milan where this pharmaceutical heroin uh, production was centered. Uh, yeah. And I have a whole chapter about that. Wow. So Charles Siragusa was frustrated because Italy, the laws were so, so they got slaps on the hand, these people. Yeah. They were higher ups in, in the Italian society and they got slaps on the hand. So he was so frustrated, he went to the American ambassador in Italy. And her name was Claire Booth Luce. Mm -hmm. She was married Publisher. to Time Magazine. Yeah. The, ma he, the owner of Time Magazine. Yeah. Uh, his name was Henry Luce. And he said to her, you know, this is absurd. These guys are shipping heroin and it's, these addicts are, are all over the streets of America. Uh, we should do something about it. So being a very powerful woman, she said, I'll see what I can do. And she, she went to the State Department and said, this has got to stop. The State Department told Italy, this is ended right now. And sure enough, that was end of pharmaceutical heroin. What year is this? 1951. 1951 yeah. Now yeah. the French connection to heroin still was pouring in. Yeah. Into the East Village, uh, one of the prime places where it was distributed. Valachi also started fooling around with uh, selling dope too, so. Oh, absolutely. He was in the Genovese family. They had their own crews of, uh, in fact, on East 4th Street, uh, if you recall, uh, Vito Genovese, after uh, going to great lengths to become the boss of the family and what he thought was the boss of the mafia, uh, he wound up going to jail for heroin dealing. Yeah. That was on East 4th Street in the East Village where that whole ring operated. Yeah. yeah. I, have a, I have a story about that in the book. You know, I often thought that that agent, you ran across Agent Orange. Have you heard of him? No. Federal Agent Orange, who went and got Genovese from Europe 
uh, from Sicily and brought him. I'm so yes, I am familiar with that. Yes, really should get the Medal of Honor or something. Genovese, he was a, he was making ten thousand a year, whatever an officer made in those days, and he offered him the world, and he could have delivered the world, and he wouldn't take off the handcuffs. He brought him back. That's and right. He deserves a lot of credit. You know that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, the, the idea of doing of covering a neighborhood is, is really, it gives people the opportunity to go place to place, location to location. As John said, it gives them the desire to go into the neighborhood and see, as opposed to, like you said, you're trying to follow in the footsteps of one man, you actually get to go into a, an actual a location that people can visit. And I think that taking this approach is, is an impressive way to go. And I think, as you said, it is unique. And I, I really, I think that it's something that a lot of people can, can appreciate. Tom, that neighborhood where you grew up, I looked on Google Earth. It's pretty huge, that project. Yes, it's called Stuyvesant Town. Now, before, Did before that, go ahead. Of the neighborhood? It was, uh, it was built by Metropolitan Life Insurance Company for uh, veterans returning home yeah. from World War II. And what they did is they wiped out all the tenements there. One of them was where Joseph Biondo grew up. And, uh, uh, but, and there were many other Italians who lived there. But they wiped them out, and they, those people did not get to live in Stuyvesant Town. Uh, and in fact, it was a famous neighborhood also, uh, just north of 14th Street, where Stuyvesant Town took over. It was called the Gas House District. And there was a famous gang called the Gas House Gang. Yeah. yeah. Now, Stuyvesant Town was huge. You're absolutely right. That went from 14th Street to 23rd Street, from 1st Avenue to the East River. We're talking about 80 acres, probably near 25,000 people. Yeah. And I lived there from 1953 to 1990. It was yeah. a great neighborhood to grow up in. The entire town I come from in Connecticut has under 18, has always had, and it's a city. This, we don't consider it a small city, 18,000 people. So you've got yep. basically a couple of blocks with what, 25,000? Yes, yeah. Well, it was, it was 80 acres, uh, which, I, you know, in the city. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. true, true. That's a lot in New York City. Did, did, so you went to each of these places and found the addresses and looked at them, physically looked at them? What I did was, uh, for my research, uh, I, I, yes, I did that, but... Uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics files, I have, their, I have their intelligence files. They were tremendous yeah. in pinpointing the areas. Yeah. Uh, I went, I, of course, I went to New York Times archives. I also went to the New York Public Library. And what helped me pinpoint a lot of these things are old reverse phone directories. Yeah. Where, you know, you, you can go by block and, and uh, they'll show all the businesses that were located at what address exactly and their phone numbers. So that was a very helpful, that was very helpful also. Yeah, we went to um, a friend of uh, Wayne, John, uh, Officer Wayne, Chief Wayne Johnson in Chicago. We did the same thing in one day. And I, I gotta tell you, I had a ball. I mean, especially if you read up on this, if, like us three, if you know what you're talking about. It's, uh, it's a thrill, really. To see. Oh, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, two of the main locations that I write about that were mafia centers closed very recently in 2016. One was called Lonza's Restaurant on First Avenue, and the other was Diva Birdie's, which I mentioned before. And they were, you, were no, you knew not to go into Lonza's. You, business was not wanted. <laughs> and it, it, like I said, because heroin was involved, you had incredible numbers of, you, incre Carmine Galante used to eat there, and he also used to eat John's, because he was the Bonanno family heroin guy. So where did you go? You went to the East Village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, John, like I said, the, the club was the United Nations. So I have another story that, yeah, uh, that ties into Chicago a little bit. Let's hear it. Are you familiar with Archbishop Marcinkus? Yes, I do know the name, yes. But uh, uh, Kalisimo get buried in the ca on Catholic. That's so, right. Right, well he, uh, this story starts uh, on Avenue A, uh, a gangster, a Genovese gangster by the name of Vincent Rizzo 
uh, as I said, there's a Genovese crew in the East Village, and his capo was a guy named Matteo Di Lorenzo. And Di Lorenzo, uh, his whole crime was financial crime, and he had uh, about a billion dollars in forged and stolen stocks and bonds. Wow. Oh, yes. Right. And, and his soldier, one of the soldiers, uh, Vincent Rizzo, his job was to, to sell that stuff. So he was known throughout the country as, as a guy that you either got these things from or you unloaded them from. Yeah. So what happened is, uh, this is 1971. Uh, a legendary New York City cop, Joe Coffey, detective with the Manhattan District Attorney's That's Office. Right. Yeah. Uh, he's tailing a guy uh, who just tried to extort the Playboy Club in New York City All on right. Fifth Avenue near Central Park. Right. And he tails him down to the East Village and uh, he sees that he's interacting with this guy, Vincent Rizzo, a lot. And uh, so he goes to his boss, the district attorney at the time, a guy named Hogan, Joe Hogan, says, I want to wire up this guy because there's something going on here. He sees a social club, another social club on East 12th Street. He sees Rizzo going in and he sees Vincent the Ching Gigante going in. He sees an, an, an yellow Della Croce, the Gambino underboss going in. He's saying, what's going on here? Th this guy's just a, a, a street punk, you know, uh, and why, why are all these big guys showing up? So there's a bar on 13th Street and Avenue A. Actually, the, again, the building that I showed uh, in the cover of my book, it was on the ground floor. It was called Jerry's Lounge. And that's where Rizzo used to hang out, do his loan sharking, bookmaking, and, uh, and also dealing in stolen and forged securities. So the DA's office wires it up, wires the phone, puts a bug in, and they hear Rizzo talking to somebody on the West Coast that the Vatican wants close to a billion dollars, billion dollars in forged and stolen securities. What happened is, they, I'm sure you know this story, they had put all their money in the hands of a guy named Michele Sindona. Oh, oh, oh. So, yeah. Remember? And what yeah. happened is he went bust. He was, he was the hot financial guy out of Milan, yeah. and everybody was investing with him, including New York Savings Banks, the Vatican, and the Gambino family. Oh. Oh. It all goes bust. So Marcinkus had put all, Marcinkus was the president of the Vatican Bank at the time. Marcinkus had put all their money in it, in with Sindona. They were broke. So he reaches out to a couple of guys he knew who call Rizzo and say, look, we, we, will, we will take a billion dollars. We got to put it in our coffers to cover up some billion dollars in forged securities. And we'll pay for four hundred seventy million for it. And so he's he's ready to make the deal. Uh, there's a printing shop again. I'll show you the location. It's gone now. Milo's Printing, literally right across the, the street from the picture on the building, Twelfth Street and Avenue A. And they print up over seven million dollars in in counterfeit bonds. Oh. Uh, another fourteen million was printed up. I think up near Buffalo, the Magadino crime family supplied them. So they ship them over. This is the first shipment. They ship them over to the Vatican. The Vatican tries to uh, deposit them in a Swiss bank. They, 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 they realize they're forged, they're counterfeited, so they won't take them. So yeah. that's the end of the deal. Uh, meanwhile, all these guys get indicted uh, by the, because by now the FBI is in it, as well as Manhattan DA's office, and the Secret Service. This what? is an international counterfeiting deal. I've never Very heard counterfeiting. of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, there's a book about it called The Vatican Connection. I, I have, I have, I, I've heard loosely about it years ago. I, that's, that's why I knew Orsinkis. Yeah, I, that's right, right. I did. Right. So what happens is uh, Sindona, as I said, part of his deal was he was laundering Gambino family drug money, Gambinos in America and Gambinos in Sicily. Yeah. He winds up getting poisoned in prison. Yeah. And uh, he hung himself on Fires Bridge or something. Is no, that, that was another one. That's Roberto Calvi. Different case? Same kind of scam. Financial scams. Uh, 
that's that happened in the 80s, a little bit after this. Wow. Uh, Google Roberto Calvi. You'll see another story involving Marcinkus. Uh, so the U.S. Attorney's Office wants to interview Marcinkus with regard to this whole scam, right? Yeah. But he's a resident of the Vatican. They can't interview him. Yeah. They won't allow it. So Marcinkus skates on it. What's but an, that all comes out of Avenue A and 13th Street and 12th Street. What's become of him, the Cardinal? Uh, he's, he's dead now. This is in the 70s. But uh, he went on for years. Really? He was, the, he was bodyguard to Pope Paul VI. Uh, he was a power, yeah. a power in the Vatican. I, I imagine he was forgiven. Yes, well, he knew where all the bodies were. <laughs> yes, exactly. He knew where all the bodies were. But the funny thing is he came out of Cicero, Illinois. Really, yeah, yeah. Which is where uh, Capone lived, that's, right, if I'm not mistaken? That's right. That's where that's where a lot of uh, a lot of uh, funny business takes place is in Cicero. Yes. Was, yeah. Capone was there, and uh, they maintained a presence through the 80s uh, is where they owned the entire town. Yeah. Our sites in, uh, on Facebook, uh, Tom, we uh, posted a story about the uh, – who made the Godfather film? What's his name? The director. I'm sorry? Uh, uh, the guy uh, Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola. For, oh, right. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. That he's redoing uh, Godfather 3 because I think he's trying to tell the story you told us in a more coherent fashion. Um, yeah, I wasn't a big fan of 3. Yeah, uh, so – He's re-releasing it with new stuff. That's so, going to be interesting. Uh, I think if he can tie in that story, which I think is sort of based on that story, isn't it? Um, yeah, there were some loose underpinnings with the Vatican and finance in that movie, if I recall. I, I think. Yeah. I, well, the I, true story is better than any movie. Trust me. That, yeah. Uh, it's, I'm it's sure you guys are going to look it up. Look up Michele Sindona and Roberto Calvi. Uh, and it's amazing. The Vatican was completely mobbed up. Wow. Yeah. The finances. So I might think you've really given uh, given us and, and, and the viewers quite a bit to uh, to chew on. This has been this is incredible. I, I think that people think about mafia and they the the growing it's just the way things became more and more sophisticated, as you've illustrated, going from nickel and dime street things and heroin and, and mugging people for jewelry up through financial schemes and, and international international bank fraud is <laughs> that kind of development is, is really incredible. And and the way you, you detailed it coming out of this one small neighborhood is, is really, really interesting. I can't I, yeah. I'm really excited about it. Let's let's see your book again. Let's, let's see. see your... uh... Can you see it? Yes. The back it up a little bit. The there you go. East Village Mafia, and that that uh, that building on the cover is where uh, that was where Aquila was was shot while his wife right in front was... of it, and where Jerry's Lounge, where they made the deals for the uh, the counterfeit bonds and stocks that that, that went to the Vatican. So quite a quite a long history of, uh, of corruption there in that building, a long long mafia history there. And, uh, and and you definitely were in position to uh, to see a lot of things in uh, in your career with the uh, department investigation and, and just being from the neighborhood. You you've been steeped in this your entire your entire life yeah. basically, surrounded by it. A funny story. Uh, I told you they wired up Jerry's lounge. Supposedly, the plant, the listening post, was in a basement in Stuyvesant Town. It very well could have been my building because it was my building was very close yeah. <laughs> to yeah. that, a block away <laughs> to Jerry's Lounge. Yeah. It's, Is it uh, 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 are they still around the neighborhood? No. 1990 was the swan song. Uh, Morgan Thaw went in, uh, District Attorney Morgan Thaw, he was, he was kind of a legend in... in uh, in New York law enforcement. He went in and wired up the Robertis because the capo then, uh, uh, handsome Jack Giordano, uh, was still operating out of D. Robertis, just like his uncle, Joe Pani Armon, just like Joe Biondo, 
it, it's, it's, that's the thing about looking at the neighborhood. They literally continued. Uh, and so he wired it up. Uh, he busted them. Uh, not to mention, besides heroin, they had, at the time, a $300 million gambling racket going in Nassau County, which is Long Island, and parts of Brooklyn. Uh -huh. uh, so that was the end. Uh, wow. By the way, if I come up there, we'll take a tour, but you'll have to Absolutely. Come, you'll have to come to Connecticut, and I'll show you where D.A. Hogan's uh, house was. He's from my hometown. Ah, really? It's a three-hour ride, but yeah, you know, it'll be worth to see that one house, yeah. They're big, Absolutely. actually. They're a, a large fan. There's still a lot of Hogan's around. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that was a big deal when I was a kid, that that was his house, uh, near Rosalind Russell's house. The oh. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, sir. Thomas, uh, I really appreciate it. Let's stay in contact. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, like I said, please come to New York. We'll go out on a walking tour, and we'll have a nice Italian meal. I would love it. I love New York. We vacationed there two years ago uh, for three days and really touristed it up and uh, still didn't see the Empire State Building and, and a lot of other things. I wish it's not worth it. Yeah, it's, I, we did it years ago. My wife and I are getting ready to come up. We're thinking March or, or sometime next year we're going to come up and see my family and we're going to do the city. So I would, I would absolutely love to, uh, to, to, to take it to where the, uh, the building is. Right. You, you guys have my phone number. And thank you both so much, John and Cam, for allowing me to come on your podcast. It's been now, a thrill. We're going to put some – we have uh, some – I'm proud to tell you we cover um, – six or seven uh, mob Facebook pages that are really popular. And this podcast will be seen by a tremendous amount of people. So we'll, so, uh, thank we'll you so your, much. We'll link to your book and we'll link to your page and we'll, uh, we'll get you open. Yeah. You, thank you so much. Thank All right, you. Tom. Good luck thank to you. Yeah, guys. Thank you. Take care. So long. Bye-bye.